think we're gonna go ahead and get started because no one wants to be the guy that made people late to lunch. <laughs> so um, yeah, without further ado, uh, my name is Tyler Brigette Get, and uh, today we're gonna be talking about the major keys to iOS design. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I live here in Denver, just a couple of blocks away. So away, uh, <laughs> made my commute two blocks shorter when he moved it over here. So pretty excited, pretty excited about that. Uh, I work for a company called Bit Systems. Yes, you know what? My microphone snuck down. How's that? Better? Yes. Okay. No problem. Cool. Uh, company called Bit Systems. It's one of those nice computery sounding terms that makes people think, you know, you know have I ever heard of that before? If, if so, it's working. Um, I do research, research uh, R and D, uh, research and DevOps, primarily focused on uh, disaster recovery, recovery over there. So something kind of sad. I don't have an Apple, an Apple Design Award yet. But something I do have, have it's happy customers, and not just because we occasionally go out for dinner with the side of jousting, jousting. Uh, it's because I work on apps that uh, people are able to pick up and easily, easily use. So before we really jump in here, uh, I've got a question for you. for you. Show of hands, do you have to have a beautiful app with intuitive UI for, for it to be successful? Do you think, you think you have to? You guys are not, you guys are not easy to trick. Uh, Snapchat, right? There's an article that just, that just came out recently at, by Bloomberg, and it's talking about how they built an entire, entire business by confusing old people. Um, the guy sitting in the, middle, in the middle of the screen there is DJ Colin, and he is by far the undisputed king of Snapchat. And, and if you hop on there, you can see him out showing fan love, getting uh, selfies with his, with his fans around town. He's on there talking about they. They don't want you to be success, successful. They wouldn't want you to enjoy your breakfast. He'd probably tell you if you're here today, they don't want you, don't want you to make great apps. He's usually out in his backyard, talking to his flowers, having, having a good time, enjoying some life. And uh, he's, he's dropping major keys. I'm, I'm just telling you to, you know, work hard. Success comes with, uh, with hard work, and uh, you know, be, you know, be, be thankful for what you got. Bless up. So, starting well. Let's see if this sounds familiar. It's Monday morning, and your boss, boss has his next great idea for how you're going to make millions of dollars. Pokemon Go for food, for food trucks. He's even gone through the trouble of coming up with a name and an icon for, icon for you. It's Truck and On Go. While you're sitting there thinking about how you're going to, how you're going to salvage this icon, uh, your coworker goes ahead and calls dibs on the math beam. Math beam. So, Reluctantly, you go ahead and decide you're going to start designing out the, uh, the detail view, showing some reviews and some information about the trucks. So you, so you pick your favorite design tool. Any sketch fans in here? Nice. Uh, if you didn't raise your hand, hopefully you'll be a believer by the time we get done. It's, done. it's pretty awesome. Um, you know, we'll work on reviews for, for this food truck. So you go ahead and you grab your, your favorite placeholder text. You know, we're talking about major, key, major keys, so there's call it Ipsum. But, um, you know, it's a food truck, so we're going to go the whole grain, whole grain sustainable hipster Ipsum. We have to have someone that is leaving a review. You know, we've been binge watching Game of Thrones, so we go ahead and look for a picture of a character from through from the show. And you know, before too long, things are kind of starting to come together. Come together, um, looking pretty good. But then you fire up Xcode, and things didn't turn out quite right. The little name for the food, for the food truck you came up with is, is too too short. Uh, and you know, when you get some real data, real data in there, it gets cut off. Um, a friend of mine has a really long last name. Name the names have been slightly changed to protect the innocent. But um, Names like that, longer, that longer names get cut off. Uh, the spacing doesn't feel so good. You know, when we, we took that placeholder, placeholder text, we filled in the space that we had. And you know, people aren't going to write long reviews and reviews on the phone. It's going to be shorter, quick, quick little updates about um, about the food trucks. So major key: start with real data. So we're talking about real data. So you've probably got some sort of API. You're working on an app for a customer, a customer, and they've got a web app or some sort of existing uh, application in place. Maybe this, maybe it's a desktop thing. And you can take that data. You can, you should get a response from it. Answer from it. You should get um, it's a JSON, whatever it is, and take a look at the data. Really get to get to know your way around it. What, what's it made out of? What are the things that you can pull out of there, out of there, and, and turn into uh, UI elements? So maybe the API is being is being built in parallel. Uh, I worked on a project where, at the same time as we were building the app, the folks, the folks were building the back end. We were also working on a, a web page at the same time. And if that if that is the case, you need to become best buds with the people on the server team. Um, um, if they've got test data, that should become your test data. Uh, if there's anything that they, that they need to be handing you or that you need to be handing back, make sure that you're really talking that through. What, what, are, you, what are you expecting from them? And when you're uh, submitting data to the server, what, what should you be handing back? Handing back, what does that look like? Uh, if you don't have the luxury of having either of those things, those things, you can cheat a little bit. You can use a Google form. Uh, you know, send that out. Kind of, kind of take what what will be the info that's coming into your app. Send that out to friends, family, family. Uh, another department in your company just to try and get uh, get some actual data, so you're not just making up like test user three. 
So maybe you're working with the thing with a sensor, some sort of uh, some sort of GPS app, or maybe you're working with a Bluetooth, a Bluetooth device that the, that the phone talks to. Get some real data from that thing. Um, um, if nothing else, at least know the bounds that the sensor can generate. <laughs> so you don't just want a face roller number pad or just pick a couple of favorite numbers when you're putting putting data that can be generated into your app. Odds are you're going to be you know building charts, building charts. You're going to be building some sort of pictures with this data. So it's good to know you know what are the ranges you're going to be dealing be dealing with. And get photos from a real device. Um, if you go, out, you go out and you grab a bunch of uh, nice you know, stock photography or you've got a friend with a pro camera or camera and taking some pictures for you, if you're planning to actually use um, pictures, from, pictures from a phone in your app, it's good to have some of this so you can really get a feel for what those are, are going to look like. You know, these, these cameras keep getting better than these phones every single year, every year but um, professional photographers and like, really nice pro photography, let's see, what's amazing, it doesn't matter what it is. Uh, and if you guess about these things, it can really come back to come back to bite you later. But if there's other things you need to fill in, so UI faces, if you're, look, if you're looking for some, um, some user profile pictures, a great place you can, place you can go. Um, you can get all sorts of user profile pictures. You can even, in some, in some cases, use these in actual apps. Maybe you're making a design app, kind of meta. Um, um, but you can use these in there. Another uh, quick thing, any URLs or uh, resources or articles or apps I mentioned in this talk, I know it can be tough sometimes, sometimes writing down all the URLs in the middle of, of a talk. So I'm going to post a post I'm going to put out there later today that has all those in there, so no, uh, no worries there. Uh, there's another neat plugin if you're a sketch fan called Craft. Haft. So the cool thing with this is you can throw in a web URL or you can throw in a, a URL that your API would hit. And it gives you right there in Sketch, there's a little toolbar, toolbar you can pop out, and it shows you what's coming back in the JSON. So you can click on that and throw it right into your app. Into your app. So you're working with real stuff, real data, and you So if we're going back to our, back to our example, trucking on Go, I think real data would probably be Twitter, right? Food trucks, all trucks, a lot of times use Twitter. So just taking a look at this real quick. What kind of data, kind of data can we get out of this? You know, tweets, a lot of times, are geotagged. Uh, there's a nice picture we can get of the, the truck. What other kind of information is there that we, there that we can take from this and roll into that app that we're so another one, draw it first. Um, I have a little bit of a problem. This is only a, only a few of the notebooks at my house. It would have been too embarrassing to put all of them on our coffee table. Um, you really do work a different side of your brain when, when you're drawing pictures on pictures, when you're going through and um, working on sketching something out. I really, really suck at drawing straight lines, so I cheat and I use graph paper and I've got a stencil, the little, little iPhone stencil, got cut off on the side there a little bit. But it's got a bunch of like basic icons built in, and you can really quick put something on paper and just start working through it. Uh, kind of the example here from from the, the trucking on go go. You can you can go back. You can erase things. If you, if you look really close, there's eraser marks all over this over this thing. But in about ten minutes, when I sat down and thought about the real data we had to work with, with there was a bunch of things that came up, a bunch of things that popped into mind. You know, if we're working with a tool with a Twitter feed to grab this data, well, we should probably let the users follow the truck truck so they can get more updates about it. Um, Pictures, you know, what, what are we going to do about, the, do about those? Where should those go? But you can take these sketches. You can work on them really quick, and that'll give you an idea, an idea of you know, where you can go when you actually put these things in your tool. You, know, you can copy the copy vectors, you can duplicate things really easy. But if you've got a couple different things you want, you want to try, you can make note of and you know, annotate all around the image while I'm, uh, I'm, draw, I'm drawing out a screen. Just give yourself a couple good notes, you know, knowing you know, what data you've got to work with, work with, what are some things you want to try out and pull it into the tool. Um, one more quick uh, pro tip on drawing things. If you have to squish your hand really hard to fit everything in your drawing, it's probably going to feel pretty squished on the phone too. Which brings us to major key, put it on the phone. So get that design off paper, off paper, get it in your computer. Um, we all have these really giant, beautiful, beautiful screens. We've got you know, Retina MacBook Pros, we've got Thunderbolt displays, 4K screens, and everything looks great on these things, right? Well, sometimes when you take your pro tip, pro tip off of there, you put it on a small phone, it's completely illegible. It's so, so small. You don't, you don't have that much space to work with on these tiny phones. Um, so lots of options for doing this. Doing this. Um, you know, so you, you pick your favorite cloud service, Dropbox, Google Drive, Drive, whatever, you can upload those into a folder, swipe through them. It's a really quick way to just, way to just see, uh, see the, the mockups you've been working on on your phone. Uh, uh, sketch mirror, if you're a sketch fan, uh, same kind of thing, but it's over local networks, so it takes, so it takes your artboards and you can swipe right through those. Marvel or Pop. Uh, a couple different apps you can take, and it's really good for checking workflows. So, uh, um, any app you can actually drag and drop little um, pictures or squares, and there's a little toolbar on the bottom you can put text on there too. And you can then take those layers, link them up, and kind of tap through your app. So, how does this workflow feel? Does it make sense to go from this screen to that screen? Um, you can do this on the phone. It gets a bit tedious after a while. This, this is great if you're like stuck at the DMV and want to try something out. Um, 
I prefer it if I've got a you know, nice big computer I can work on. I like, kind of like to work on the, the screens there, move them on, and then kind of test some things out, tap around on them. Um, major key, don't reinvent the wheel, the wheel. So familiar is good. And there really is such a thing as being, as being too clever. And you've got to remember, when you're coming up with these apps, when you're coming up with ways to solve, to solve the problems that your app is trying to attack, you're not going to be there to explain how it works. It works. So here's a story about a hamburger. So back, back before we knew the hamburger menus were hiding features from our users, I was working with another, des another designer, and he had what seemed like a great idea at the time. He wanted a hamburger menu that hovered. But the trick was this hover burger was on top of a map. And like all good maps, you could pinch to zoom, you could pan it around, and there was data on the map. So now we have this menu that you can drag around that acts differently from the, from the icons that are on the map. And it was kind of the idea was like, well, maybe we can, maybe we can save some screen real estate. But at the end of the day, there's too many moving parts here. There's too many, too many things. You, you're going to have data on your map that people are like, why does this menu act differently? Is this, is this, is this a feature of the map? What's, what's going on here? In the end, we just wound up using the navigation, navigation bar. There weren't a whole lot of other menu options we could invent. There weren't extra problems we could solve, we could solve by just inventing menu items to throw in this, uh, this hover burger. We needed one more button, and we needed to be able to go back to the previous view. 25% 25, 25 of the people that download your app will get rid of it after the first user. will just abandon it, not even worry about deleting it. And you don't need to give them extra reasons to not come back. Major key, know the ingredients. Uh, um, back before he was selling minivans for Chrysler, Jim Gaffigan was talking about one of the first jobs he, jobs he had when he was working at a Mexican restaurant. And people would come in and say, you know, what's nachos? nachos? What's a burrito? What's a taco? What's a tostada? And he'd say it every time, it's a tortilla, tortilla, cheese, meat, or vegetables. At the end, he said, it's just that hard to follow. It's all, this, it's all the same. It's a lot of the same ingredients. And the same is true for so many apps that we carry around, carry around in our pockets. According to Apple, you got bars, views, and controls. My mom used to write cookbooks, and one of the best parts about being related, being related to a cookbook author is the research. So you get to go out to restaurants, try different dishes, dishes, and see if you can deconstruct what's in them. How are they made? How are they prepared? What are the ingredients, ingredients used to put them together? So let's do that for a few apps real quick. What's a four, what's a four square? What's a swarm? Uh, used to be one app got split into two. It's a social recommendation uh, engine, so used for uh, location-based things. So finding, finding stuff that you like nearby, nearby. Well, what's it made out of? Turns out bars, views, and controls. So looking at this a little bit closer, you've got a navigation bar on top, tab bar at the bottom, the bottom. There are views. These are uh, list views, collection views, different ways of showing, of showing, showing data. Inside of those is broken down to sub views. So you've got uh, UI, UI image views, you've got labels uh, for your text, there's a map stuck in there in the middle, shows you how, uh, how you can get to the, the, the restaurant. And there's also controls, so buttons, places where you can type. Different controls, different controls, ways of manipulating the data, not just looking at it. So let's look at another one. What, what's Instagram? Well, it's a nice photo sharing app. There's filters, it's pretty neat. Well, what's it made out of? Turns out, bars, views, and controls. Navigation bars, action bars up top, our old friend tab bar at the bottom. Views, you've got, um, didn't, didn't design the thing, but kick a guess at that first view, it's probably some sort of, sort of table view, it's got the pictures in it. Uh, collection view for showing off the, uh, the, uh, the search and also the pictures on your profile. And controls. Uh, when, you're going, when you're going through, when you're liking a post, when you're commenting on it, when you're sharing it, when you're changing up things on your things on your profile, those are all different controls. So now you try. What's your favorite? What's your favorite app? Games don't count. It's an entirely different conference talk. But what's it? But what's it made out of? I'll tell your neighbors. Come on, it's three it's 360 item. We can be friendly here, right? You can tell your neighbor what your favorite app is made out of. See, by using controls. Exactly. Right on. So, so what about custom actions? So um, the Hubbard Burger wasn't a good idea, but there's got to be got to be places where custom actions can be helpful, right? Um, so here's here's a few uh, instance, instances that I think are really good use cases. So there was no there was no tears or blood involved in this com uh, conference talk, but there was some sweat for sure. So so on Nike Plus, if you start the app, you go for a run. There's, there's two buttons that show up. You can end the run or you can resume if it pauses. So so they stop you from accidentally ending your run prematurely by making the end button end button. Custom control that you have to hold down until it fills up that gauge to actually finish the, finish the run. So if it's just bounce around in your pocket unlocked, you're not going to accidentally stop your run two, two blocks from your house. Pinterest, really great one here. So a couple different ways to save a pin. One, you can tap a pin that's in your feed and then tap the save button. Or if you play around with the app a little bit, you realize, realize that you can long press on the pin and a little menu pops out. Really convenient control, you can hit, you can hit a button, you can save it, you can like it. Uh, really handy. We've talked we've talk about Swarm just a second ago. And this one has got this really cool uh, thing with a nav bar, a nav bar at the top, and the, the app first loads up. But the first time it opens up, it gives you a little bump, a bump, kind of a shake on the top of that nav bar. And it lets you know that this is a toggle. This is something that you can, you can swipe. 
So rather than varying around your location settings, something that Apple should do is you do is you can share your location with your friends in my neighborhood. So trying to create those times of like, hey, hey, I'm kind of close by Jeff. Maybe we should go grab a coffee. Maybe you don't want to have that have that turned on. You're busy doing other things. You don't have to dig down through a bunch of menus. They made a nice little short little shortcut for you there at the top, just swiping that bar back and forth. So custom components, components, a couple things to keep in mind. Um, you want to save people from themselves. If there's a, an, action, an action that might be destructive in your app, find a way, you know, even more than just a pop-up, you don't want to just use, just use a pop-up, because no one reads those anyway. Like, are you sure you want to delete this? Too late, it's already gone, already gone, right? I didn't read, I deleted it. Um, shortcuts for your power users. So how, so how are ways that the people that use your app can actually get better at using it over time? We were talking about, we talking about Snapchat a little bit ago, and it's really easy when you pop that thing, pop that thing up the first time to realize, like, oh, if I tap this button, I take a picture, a long hold on it, and I'm taking, I'm taking a video, and I send that to someone, and it disappears. But the more you play with the app, you realize, you realize, oh, there's filters. I can swipe through, I can see different filters, and I can long press on my face. I get all these, get all these cool like face swaps, or I can look like somebody else. I can look like a giraffe. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. But the more that you play with the app, the more fun it becomes. But the critical path, the path, of just sending pictures, sending videos to you, your friends, super, super easy. And if you're interested in, in uh, custom components, Andrea Jensen is going to be talking about, talking about that a little later this afternoon, and that should be a great talk. So stealing like a like up artist. It's Apple conference, conference. We love Uncle Steve, right? 1994. There's an interview, he's, he's quoted all the time. Good artists copy, great artists, artists steal. But everyone quotes that, they leave out the next line, where he said, we have always been, always been shameless about stealing great ideas. Sounds kind of ruthless, Uncle Steve. Shame, shameless about stealing. A little while later, uh, Phil Schiller came out and he said, I think, I think what he meant by steal is learn the way that artists have from past masters. You figure out what you like about it and what you want to incorporate into your idea, take it further, do something new with it. As I was preparing for this, preparing for this talk, Kevin Cicero, the Instagram CEO, gave me the best possible gift he could. They wound up adding pretty much a copy of Snapchat stories to, stories to Instagram. And in a recent interview with TechCrunch, Kevin System said, totally, totally, they deserve all the credit. He says, you can't just recreate another product. What you, can, what you can say is what's really great about our format and does it apply to our network. But looking at them side by side, it looks like a lot was applicable. applicable. Um, <laughs> now, Instagram Stories doesn't have the ability to add, to add filters or, well, I guess they have filters. They don't have the, the cool face recognition stuff going on, going on yet with face swaps and all that. But Facebook owns a facial recognition company, so I'm sure that's not too far behind. And this is not the first time I've never tried to copy, copy Snapchat. There was two other failed attempts before, Poke and Slingshot. Um, but we'll see, I'll see. I don't know, is, is, this, is this the magic bullet this time? I don't know. If stolen before, it hasn't, hasn't, hasn't worked. So then you gotta remember, major key, no one else is solving your problem. problem. So even when they're pulling this in from Snapchat, there's things about it that aren't gonna work quite, this, quite the same. There's a lot of great examples for this uh, regarding social apps, apps. Uh, you know, talking about, we just looked at one right there, but you know, features, uh, there was the hashtag, the tag that Facebook pulled in from Twitter. But there's some other, other apps that maybe we're, not, maybe we're not building social apps. So we're going to take a look at two kind of really quick case studies. Uh, one, one with a whole lot of data input and one with some sensor data to kind of see what we might want to, want to steal from other apps. So how many people flew in for 360 on 60 Nice. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to Denver. Um, and congratulations. You've all been hired to work at my new startup, 5280 Airlines. So we're going to make an app for it. So a couple things we've got to think about. Think about what, what should these airline apps do? Did anyone book their flight with an app? What, what did it let you do? Pick a date. Do we have to you know, pay for your bags in advance? I know there's some of that. Your bags fly free. Options. Pick options, that's right. All right, so a couple things we need to figure out what our app's going to do. So let's, let's take a look at some other apps. And based on what our airline does, we'll, we'll say that um, first bag flies free. Um, we have Wi-Fi in air because, well, we go into a conference, we get some Wi-Fi, right? We'll all die without it, without it. So here's, here's four apps. Uh, going from left to right, you got, you got Southwest, United, JetBlue, and Frontier. So this is at launch, it's launch. This is what happens when you first pop the app open. And just looking at that, there's a whole lot of different, different things going on. Um, the two on the outsides are using our old friend, the tab bar. But the two on the inside for doing navigation, they've got these different size buttons. buttons. Now, they make these buttons different size because they think that flight status and checking in, checking in or your trips are particularly important and that you should see those more. What are the other ones? Um, Southwest is trying to convince you, like, hey, we got nothing to hide, hide. We're Southwest, we're a good guy. Uh, JetBlue, they're trying to sell you a credit card. You know, what, are, what are the things that we want to do as our company? What are we trying to tell our users about ourselves? Um, Frontier, when I fired that thing up, it was offering me flights from, bless you, bless you, from an airport all the way across the country. And don't get me wrong, I'd love to fly out of Florida, out of Florida, but I'd probably have to get there first. So let's go ahead and try to book a flight, shall we? 
So like we said, we're gonna need to know where we're going from, where we're going, where we're going to, what are the dates, um, how many people are going, can I pay with points, am I, am I paying with dollars? Um, in the case of JetBlue, they've got some sort of special thing, but if you're booking a group of eight or more, they want you to know there's some, there's some trouble you might run into. Uh, Frontier, they're just going to find out about how many people you have off the get-go, and then they're going to, going to you know, offer to sell you a seat, they're going to offer to sell you a carry-on bag, they're going to offer to sell you which sell you which check bag, a little further down the line. And take a look at these things, these things. this is the exact same action done on all of these apps. There are some similarities between the icons, the icons, there's some differences between the icons. All a slightly different approach to solving the problem, the problem of booking an airline ticket. So we made our search, we know, the, we know where we're going. How easy is it to change up the dates? You know, if I want to say, hey, I'm a little flexible, can I save, can I save a couple bucks coming in a day early, flying out a day late, those kind of things. I know, that, I know that if I'm flying somewhere, I like to know, am I, am I going in one hop? Is this gonna be like a, like a four hour flight, or is this a 10 hour flight with a layover in the middle uh, somewhere? I don't know. Um, United, we love those guys, right? They show us they've got Wi-Fi, got Wi-Fi on there, how, how nice. Uh, when we search for a flight, JetBlue lets you know that it might, it might cost a little extra up front if you want to have this flight be fully refundable later. later. And the kind of interesting thing I have to stop up front here is rather than, other than being two stops, so all the rest of the apps, you click your first day, you pick a flight, and then, and then it takes you to another view that shows like the same list just for your return flight. Frontier shows both of, both of those in one view. So up on top there, you've got your departure flight, here are the ones that are, the ones that are available, which one would you like, and you scroll down and pick your return flight. A little different take on, take on. So checking in, pretty simple thing, right? We just need to know our confirmation number and maybe our last name. Well, depending on the app. So in one case, in case, they need our first name. JetBlue wants to know what city you're flying out of. And Frontier, it, it isn't just a matter of, hey, let's pick up this trip. Let's show you the trips that you've been on before when you, when you go to check in. Um, it could be handy. Maybe you're going to go look up an old, old flight and put in your, uh, your travel time for work. Nice, easy way to get to it, right? So a whole bunch of different ways of doing the exact same action. Sad, sad day, we actually don't have our planes. 52 airlines is canceled. You're all, you're all fired. But congratulations, you've been hired. At Fit Den, it's fit, fitness app, fitness app for Denver, uh, branded for the for the city here. Colorado is the fifth state in the nation, and I usually don't help our stats out with that too much because I live right across from my from my favorite pizza restaurant. Um, but people love running here. There's a big, big fitness big fitness market. So if we're talking about a fitness app, do we got anybody that runs their bikes or uses an app with an app when they do that? Cool. So if we're making an app, how do we want to go about it? About it. It's a couple different ways, right? There's a step counter, so it's passive. You don't have, you don't have to actually do anything. A little bit easier on the battery. You're not using the GPS to uh, to figure out to figure out where you're going. Maybe you want something active. I know um, sometimes it's nice to see you know if I you know if I run the same route, how fast was I around it this time? So we're gonna take a look at a few more apps and see you know see you know the ways that they solve that. What would we maybe want to steal from these apps? So left to right, we got Nike Plus, Strava, and Cakewalk. So Nike Plus and Strava, you're doing you're doing the the uh, activity logging. So you're saying, hey, I went on a run, I went on a bike ride, and here's what here's what I did. Uh, when you first fire Nike up, it shows you the total number of miles run, it shows you, it shows you what your friends have been up to, so it kind of says like, hey, you've, this guy has gone, gone 344 miles this past month, I went three. <laughs> that means I should, I should probably move a little more, right? Um, when you fire up Strava the first time, you can see what your friends have been up to, you can, you can give them a little you know, likes, a little thumbs up, which you hey, good, good job on that bike ride. Uh, Kickwalk, if you've done a good job and you hit your step goal, it says, hey, good job, good job. If you haven't, it insults you. And you can configure it to publicly insult you on Twitter, adding, adding, to, adding to your shame. Interesting way to build motivation and highly effective, I will, I will add. So how about challenges? So each one of these apps goes about it in a unique way. So Nike, I make a challenge, I invite my friends. I'm competing against people I know. Strava, I, jo I join a challenge. So this is some sort of community thing that's been set. How many miles can we run this month, month you know, what, these types of things, September birthdays, whatever. Uh, Kickwalk, it looks at how you've, been, how you've been doing it. It says, hey, let's just push you a little bit further. Here's the number of steps you've been taking. Let's go for a few, for a few more. Activity feed, let me see what I've been doing. Nike, when you get done with the run, there's a little questionnaire you fill out and you can say, okay, how, how, did, I, how did I feel after this run? I'm a pretty happy guy, I saw my runs and you know, felt good, right? Um, um, what kind of surface were you running on? Were you running on a track, running on the road, running on dirt? How was the weather? You can kind of check those things, but looking back through this, you can say, okay, was I affected by, affected by the weather that day? Was it just an off day? Was it super hot? Um, Strava show, shows you your GPS track in this view, shows you how many people liked your run or your workout or your bike, bike, bike ride. Kickwalk, I think this is kind of cool. They've got um, kind of plumbing the cake, cake theme all the way through. It shows you a list of candles that you can scroll back through. And if you hit your roll, hit your roll for the day, it lights up the candle. And when you've got a streak of those candles lit up, and then you have one that one doesn't get lit up, you're like, oh man, I feel better about it. It's not, it's not how we want to be, be, be going about things. A little bit more, you can get extra detail. So with these GPS apps, 
show you a track, shows you how you've been doing. Um, some Strava, we were talking data earlier, some numbers we're getting from the sensors. So you know how fast you fast you ran over a certain uh, certain mile. So breaking down those miles, pretty quick up front and slowed down as I went. So that's, that's interesting data to know. But if, we, but if we just made up some numbers, how would those charts go for designing things? Gotta have, got have some real data for that. Uh, Kick walk, you can tap on any of the candles and see what your goal was and see what, see whether or not you hit it. And then records. So, uh, Nike does this nice thing, this nice thing. They make kind of a big deal and they have some sort of sports hater come on to you know, good job, fastest mile, good job getting out there today. It's a nice little attaboy, just kind of a little good, remi good reminder. Um, keep going. Strava does this cool thing where they break down, down different parts of our roads and trails as segments. So people can submit and submit segments and you can see, how did I do on this segment? Was I the fastest person there this week? This week? How did I stack up? Was this my best time of all going down that segment? What was my, what was my third best? How did I do? Um, Kick walk kind of sticking with the public public shaming thing. It shows you how you stack up against your friends on Twitter. Just it's kind of fun, kind of fun. So we're looking at other apps. When we're when we're, when we're stealing like ours, we gotta remember something. What are you building? No one else is solving your problem. Your problem. Um, you know what's being done in that space? What can we do to move a little, a little bit further forward? You know, for, for building an airline app, there were things that I know from some of those screens. I was like, well, that's that's a good idea. I think I'd like to take that idea and idea and see what we can do with it. There's also ideas equally as important that we'd like to leave behind. behind. Is there a certain interaction that we look at that you know, is just not working quite right? I think, it's, I think it's equally important the things that we leave behind that we don't implement that we see other people doing, as it is the things that we you know, latch onto and kind of look at as standards uh, in the industry. And uh, you know, for, for, like, like we, were talk, we were talking earlier in the keynote, um, you look at those buttons, there's like a week of work that goes into making that, looking at one little button. So if you're looking at a button, if you're you know, trying to pull things out of an app, You've got to think about what goes into, what's all the work that goes into making that button. There's a whole bunch of code behind that. So keep those things in mind. So beating, beating design, design block. So sometimes you have all your data and you make it a nice drawing, nice drawing, you work it through your tool, you look at some other apps and you're still stuck. So, so what do we do? Major key, murder your darlings. Now I'm not trying to, trying to get you on the line, I promise. Um, this is going through and taking, taking a look at pieces of your app and saying, okay, what is something that we think we have to keep? And getting rid of it. I was working on an app one time. Our team was working on an app where we had we had a client that wanted to keep this really complex search filter right as soon as the app launched. The app launched, and most people were coming into the app and they just wanted to look at the data, just wanted to see what what new what new things had happened. But this guy was really just intent on keeping this, this super complex filter. Like filter. It was kind of it was something more like people like us, like people that see things as a database would want to create. It creates like a really deep search capability. And Wound up, we don't, we don't talk to the guy and say, hey, most people are looking at this and they just want to see updates. They want like a simple, a simple search so they can search for a name. They don't want to do this crazy time recruiting and all these things right now. So, so find somewhere to put that somewhere else. Do you, do you have to keep that thing that you're holding onto in the middle of the app? Yeah. Is there somewhere else that it makes sense? Another one, look at crazy concepts. Steps. So this is the mini next 100 concept. And it's, and it's, it's pretty sweet. Uh, so what mini says they're going to be in the next 100 years. And, and look at the roof of this thing, there's like LEDs and there's like a number on the side and that customizes because it's based on the person who's driving it. It's like a ride sharing car, you know, every Mini is your Mini. So that's what they're saying. But there's a whole lot of things about this concept car that will never make, ever make it to production. So look at the front of it, that's a glass bumper. That's probably not super, not super safe, right? I don't know how you replace those headlights, look at those things. Um, um, let's go ahead and look at the inside. Where's the airbags? I don't see any airbags, right? That little three-piece knob thing in the middle, it's called a Cooperizer. It runs the, info, the infotainment system. I'm not so sure if there's a heater for it to run or an air conditioner or not. But there's an inspire me button in the middle that shows you content that will lift your spirit, your spirits during the middle of the day. And I, I don't know if you actually want to build a car that is like offering offering you content when you get into it, right? That's probably not something that's going to fly uh, in, a, uh, in a production vehicle. So you can go out and look at all these things on these sites. There's you know, there's you know, all sorts of really good, great places, Dribble, Pinterest, and Behance, yes, to look at concepts people are coming up with, or sometimes people showing off works in progress. Yes. But kind of like you know, stealing like artists from other apps, something you have to remember, is these aren't solving your problem either. And a lot of these, much like that mini, are not going to be road, be road worthy. These are apps, these are concepts that are built um, without, without having the same requirements like a real life app would have. So keep that in mind when you're looking at them. Uh, Pinterest for the longest time, I passed this one over because I thought it was just like a place for my wife, my wife to come up with the, the fate of our poor IKEA furniture. But there's a lot of great stuff in there. The coffee table turned out great, by the way. Um, there's a lot of great things in there. There's, there. there's a lot of good app concepts, there's a lot of good icons. Um, if I'm starting a new project, it's a, great, it's a great way to put together a nice collection of resources for um, you know, going back and looking, looking, looking at it later. Um, Behance, I, I kind of see this one as maybe, maybe a little more real life than Dribble, but your, your mileage may vary. 
as far as just, as far as just keeping up on new things that come out, I think the product touch is great. Uh, just kind of keeping the pulse on what, what trends are starting, to, are starting to emerge with apps that are getting released, and it's kind of a curated collection of new things that are coming, that are coming out daily. Major key, make something ugly, ugly. You're going, to, you're going to go back home and your boss is going to ask you, where did you learn at this conference? You're going to say, some jerk with a red beard, red beard, told me to make an ugly app. And I am. I'm telling you to make something, something ugly. Um, love this comic. So you can't straight, straighten a picture sometimes until you hang it on the wall. If you're working with this data, this data, you're looking at it, and you're not so sure how the pieces can fit together. I, I love to make like, these quick little ugly, little ugly apps. So take all the data, kitchen sink, throw it in there, and start to play with the app. Walk around, walk around take it to lunch. You know, see, see what you can do with it. Uh, what do you wish that it did? What is the app supposed to do? What, what interaction is not easy enough to do? And then go through and just, through and just start trimming out bits, cut things off, uh, rearrange them, see how it fits together. Leveling up. So always got to be improving your skills, right? So major key, learn to write. So I'm not, I'm not saying you've got to go out and write the next Harry Potter book or the next Old Man in the Sea. But there's a lot of places in your app where you're talking to your users. A lot of places where you're explaining, you're explaining things. There's buttons, there's text, there's all sorts of bits. So, I want, to make, I want to make sure that you're making the best of that time. So be helpful. Um, when, I was, when I was going through and almost accidentally booked a flight from Chicago to Denver when I was making the little, little case study earlier, United's app, when it was loading up the flights, warned me and said, hey, hey, just so you know, it might cost you extra to check your bags. Uh, loading can be a big missed opportunity. What are things that you can be telling your users with that time at time? You know, no one cares what your server's doing. They care what, your, what, pro what problem your app is solving for them. So tell them how you can help them be better at doing that with your app. Tell them what they can do. Uh, like I said, no one wants to submit a form. Um, anytime you look at like a social app or you look at something else, they're telling you what, what, what sort of superpower it gives you. You know, people love you know, telling you what they're up to. They love sharing photos, like photos with friends, streaming millions of songs. You know, what is that superpower that you give them? And find a good way to, good way to explain that. Show some personality. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of the app Clear. It's one of the to-do uh, list apps out there. It's like all gesture-based, based, really cool for looking for an app that's got a good uh, use of gestures. It's excellent. Um, um, but they're, they're playing to their audience. So when you go ahead and you clear out all of the to-dos in a list, and it's probably the worst confidence screenshot ever, but I wanted to throw, wanted to throw that up there, uh, it gives you a quote. So you just got done, or maybe you're starting a new list, and it's, and it's a blank list. And they put you a quote in there, some sort of inspirational quote. And the one that's, the one that's up there, it's from Bruce Lee. It says, absorb what is useful, reject what is useless, add, add what is specifically your own. And I don't know, I read that, I was like, oh man, oh man. Like, how fitting! I was even working on a talk, admin specifically. My own. Look at this. We're, we're talking. We're talking about children like artists. And thank you, Clear. That's great. Um, but you've got to. You've got to want to be serious. So if my bank app is having trouble loading and loading up my account balance, that's not time for like a funny error message. Error message. Um, <laughs> knowing knowing when to be serious. Knowing when to say, Hey, sorry, sorry, we're having some troubles. We're, we'll get this sorted out soon. I'm just just got to make sure you're doing things in the right context. And if you're working on a chatbot app, I know it's becoming very, becoming very popular these days. Uh, you're chatting with some sort of machine learning thing, some sort of AI guy who's talking back to you. Um, you got to give those things good personality. I hate, hate calling up my credit card company. It's like, say one to speak with the representatives. Two, two and it's, it, that's never speak with the representative, right? It takes you like five menus deep. No one wants to talk to that over text. We hate talking to those things on the phone. You don't want to be typing to them. So, so um, have a little personality. Major key, read, read. A um, couple books. The classic, of course, uh, design of everyday things and things. It took me a lot longer than I probably should have to get around to reading this. And you get in the middle of it, middle of it, and you're reading, and you realize like you're listening to stories about you know, old, fa old fax machines and voicemail systems that don't quite work right. Like, why do I care about this? And then it hits you. I have built the app equivalent of this terrible voicemail system. How can I do this better? Um, there's so much great terminology in that book, and just a lot of really, really good uh, examples that I think um, definitely worth reading. The one in the middle, in the middle hooked. So not just talking about how things look, but how they work. Uh, I mentioned earlier that a lot of people, only 25% you know, mail in your app, your app after the first use. How do you get people to keep coming back? And this is a great book, a great book, a lot of good, uh, a lot of good information in there, really quick read. Uh, there's a quote in the middle of it that says, it says, the greatest return on investment generally comes from increasing a product's ease of, ease of use. Make sure that your product is so simple that users already know how to use it and, and you've got a winner. And at the end of every chapter, there's a nice little section that says, hey, here's what we just, we just went over, here's what we just learned. How can you apply these techniques to your app? How can you get people, come, people coming back? Currently reading, so I can't give it my, uh, my full stamp of approval. Approval is designing products people love. Uh, and this kind of looks at you know, where, the, where the, the, the state of the union, if you will. So right now, we've got this thing going on where it's you know, the, lean, the lean, lean startup, where it's the lean products. And we're building these MVPs, and we're throwing them out there. And this is the first time in history we've ever been able to build things like that. Back 100 years ago, years ago, 
you had to make sure, you know, and I'm gonna have to like, get a factory, you have to build all these things, I've got things, I've got to make sure I've got a, a fit for my product. And more than just making something minimally viable, viable, is it minimally lovable? You know, what is an app that people will like to use? It's not just not just like it technically works, but something that people can really latch onto or enjoy. Other good reading, uh, Facebook Media and Foursquare all have really excellent design, design blogs. Um, learn a lot from reading about their process. It makes me feel, I feel a little less crazy when I go through and I see a long post about the redesign of designing a, a viewer button and I see all the iterations that they throw away. Um, I, I know there's a lot of times where we're like just tirelessly tweaking these little things in our apps and that's, that's how really good things get built as you're going through and you're really working through iterations on software. Um, there's a great talk at WWDC called Work It Over, Over and they're going through iterating on a design for, um, I think it's like a lunch ordering app. So, Really cool to see the way that they take a whole bunch of different concepts and narrow it down to the one to the one that they think is going to work best. It kind of goes through the discussions they have of, of you know, what, what's going to work about this app, what do I like about it, how do we how do we how do we make uh, our two opinions work together? And you know, when you're looking at these things, really really look for uh, the decisions they make. Why do they make these decisions? You know, there might be a button that's a certain it's a certain color or it's in a certain place. And there's a lot of these articles that get put out. You know, hey, you know, hey, here's my redesign of Facebook, or here's my redesign of the app of the Apple website. And a lot of times we can look at these things and say, oh, that's, that's, that's clearly a much better design. But sometimes when they're giving you the rationale for a certain way that the way that the thing is put together, it makes you look at the rest of the app like as a whole and say, okay, say, okay, so it makes sense why they built it that way. What users am I not thinking about that I need to consider consider uh, in a certain way? So major key, study the masters, masters. So we just talked about reading a little bit. Um, you can get on a list, a list, and go to the Louvre and copy a fancy picture. It's pretty sweet. Um, um, something you can do, you can do the same thing with an app design. So you're just starting, you're starting out um, learning how to draw. So one of the things you, first things you do is you learn how to trace, trace. So you get a piece of paper, put it over a picture, draw it, and then you start copying pictures, pictures, and then before you know it, you've gotten to the point where you can come up with things all on your own. You don't have to look, have to look at uh, a picture that someone else has already made. But you can do the exact same thing for same designing. So take a look at an app. Uh, this is something that people do all the time. As soon as, as soon as there's a new iOS drop, there was a million different like, sketch. Uh, uh, resource folders that came out like the day after the WWDC talk. So people are taking screenshots, they're tracing over top. What are those elements made of? What's the spacing? The spacing on like what's the font? What is the corner radius on the, on the pictures? And you can start to start to learn, get an eye for how the things fit together and what's what's good about the way that it's put together. What's good? What's, what's about the composition that makes it so appealing? So with the exception of spiteful competitors. No one goes out and downloads an app with the idea in mind of, oh, I want to give this thing one, one star, right? So soon we're all going to be waiting in line for the iPhone 7. Don't act like you won't be. Come on, I'll see you at Cherry Creek Mall. You know, you know you'll be there. And don't get me wrong, I'm sure it's going to be a great device. Um, but, pe but people buy these things for so much more than what comes out of the box. They buy it because the people in this room, the people at this conference, and the developer community make apps that make the thing useful. They make it entertaining, it makes it fun. And I think they really do want, do want great apps. So let's go out there and make them. Thank you. So we, got, so we got a couple of minutes left. So we're going to do a little choose your own comments adventure here, real quick. Real quick. Um, we're not quite to lunch yet. So we got a, time for a couple, couple questions and or an iOS 10 update your app speed round. So if you want questions, raise your hand. Okay, we got a question, and then we'll, and then we'll go maybe speed up real quick, and then we'll get to lunch. We'll beat the other people to lunch. How great will that be? Have that. What's the best way or approach that you found for multiple screen size support uh, to communicate with developers like standards with padding, spacing, alignments, uh, adjusting ratios, etc. So the question is, how do you, when you're dealing with multiple screen sizes, how, how do you handle communicating to developers uh, padding and sizes and you know, consist consistency throughout throughout the look and feel? Correct. Yeah. All right. So um, I hate to say this because we're at an iOS conference. Go take a look at the, the the Android material specification. It's really well thought out. It's really well really well put together. Um, I think you know if you've got a document, some sort of a style document that you can say say okay, our our images are always you know eight pixel padded from the side. Uh, we're always leaving this much space on the top and bottom, and sometimes that changes a little bit when, the, when, the, when you've got more space. I know we have a few apps that we work on that it looks different on iPad, iPad, and Portrait when it does in landscape, and moving things around. Um, I think just making sure you've sure you got that really spelled out in like a style guide. And so is it usually, it's usually a style guide versus doing a design for the smallest device? Device, device? And yeah, let's give it a go back to you. So it depends. So sometimes you're working on, 
again, I've had a time I was making an iPad at first and then the iOS or the iPhone app came after. Um, I think it comes down to a style guide and just making sure you're, when you see those inconsistencies, if you can't fix them yourself, just making sure you keep really good communication. Um, try to talk about, talk about the server team if you're building the app, uh, the API in parallel. Yeah, yeah, just making sure you've got that good communication going on with the team. It's, yeah, it's not, I'm going to say it's like a hard and fast rule, but yeah, style guide. It's one of those pages on your like team wiki that you know, no, one ever, no one ever visits. Just making sure you get those meetings in place. You know, like quick ones, not beat people in the head with it, with it, but just, hey, here's how we want to consistently communicate with our users with the way that we structure, we structure our apps and our data. And uh, that'll be my, my take on it. Any questions? Yes, please. So the question is talking about uh, images in your app. So you've got the size, different sizes, 1x, 2x, 2x, 3x. Any resources for creating the different sizes and keeping track of that? Um, I'm going to go back to Sketch on this one. Uh, it's pretty sweet. You can make an app. Uh, you, can make, you can make an icon. You can make a picture. And you can set different export um, um, exports for it. So uh, what I'll do a lot of times is I'll make an app icon, and then, and then I'll make an export for it that's like, this is my 1x. I'll usually design it at 2x. and then. You know, make an export for it and say, okay, here's my 1x, here's my 3x. Here's my and if I go through and I see that things are getting too squished on the smaller size, size, I'll go back and fix that. And starting with kind of that middle case and then being able to adjust for larger and smaller for smaller from there is kind of my approach. Um, yeah, Sketch is just a great way for handling different sizes. The whole vectors and the way that it scales on export is awesome. And I'll see if I can't, if I can't find a good, uh, good article or put something together for that. Anything else? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, along the same lines, uh, if you try using like PDFs instead of, instead of the so question is talking about using PDFs in, instead of images for uh, assets in the app. And I, to be honest, I haven't. Uh, uh, my only real uh, expertise with PDFs in an app was like implementing a PDF reader. Um, it's back to the stones. I know that. The, yeah, I know that a couple of times. That I've dug, I've dug like under the hood on the PDF spec, it's like 1,700 pages if you put all 25, 25 years of change and decisions together. Um, it gets cr crazy in a hurry. Um, you know, there, there's a couple libraries out there. There's one free, one free one. I'll, I'll throw that in the, the talk notes as well. I can't think of it off the top of my head, but typically for typically for PDF libraries, there's a couple pay for ones. There's one there's one that's free and it doesn't have, it doesn't have much support. Um, but yeah, typically just using uh, other vectors or vectors or exporting those vectors to things when I put them in the app. Anything else? Excellent. Really quick, um, um, for going for iOS 10, big old fonts, lots of space around things, and uh, um, table views are a little bit taller, and uh, buttons look like, like buttons again. When iOS 7 came out, I know that we had an app where it was this nice, you know, glossy, glossy iOS 6, you know, really skimmed more thing. We put out the iOS 7 app, all the buttons, the buttons turned into those little like, blue links, and everyone's like, what, what is this? I don't know how to get around this thing anymore. anymore. Um, buttons look like buttons again, so go about to make those things. Anyway, thank you so much. You guys have been great, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.